Hello and welcome to Online Check-In, your regular guide to what's making waves in travel on the web. I'm Carmen Roberts. When you go away on holiday, how important is an eco-friendly hotel? And I'm not just talking about those establishments that don't wash your towels every day. Well, ecoluxhotels.com has independent reviews of the world's greenest luxury hotels. Every hotel gets two unbiased reviews by a professional environmental consultant, as well as an established travel writer. You can't book on the site, but it's a great way to find out a hotel's eco-credentials without the greenwashing. And the same goes for booking a tour. So here's a site that claims to give independent travellers the peace of mind that they're booking a unique experience that has a positive impact on the community. Tours on the excursionist.com might not be cheap, but you can search your passions like food and drink or nature, and the site will throw up a selected list of experiences. Fancy a private peak inside a closed tomb in Luxor, or tiger tracking with animal scientists in India. If that's a bit too wild, then check out this new app designed for locals and travellers looking for trustworthy recommendations for where to eat, shop, play and explore. Wenzani is a free app that curates travel guidebook content and connects travel questions to answers from people you know on Facebook and Twitter. Yes, I know what you're thinking, nice little bit of self-promotion there. But as well as Lonely Planet and BBC Travel, this app also features content from Frommers and the Going Out Gurus at Time Out. My main gripe is that there's no wish list function, so I can't keep track of those great tips. Another app that's whipped smartphone users into a frenzy is Wanda. It's like having a pen pal with a modern high-tech twist. Create a profile and it will match you with a user or guide from another part of the world. You are then given a list of photo missions, like what you ate for dinner or how you get to work. And so begins an exchange of snapshots and you can compare and contrast your cultures and ask each other questions with the help of a built-in translator. A great way to find out about a destination from the comfort of your mobile phone. But if you do happen to be travelling and you lose your mobile phone, or worse still your passport, most of us would be in a pickle. But not necessarily. iCroak.com offers 50 megabytes of safe storage so that you don't have to carry paper copies. Users can log in from their phone, laptop or internet cafe and all of their paperwork is there ready to be printed off. How do you keep your travel documents safe? Let me know your top tips and any other handy website hints. The address is fasttrack at bbc.com. Another travel problem is the so-called lottery of who you sit next to on a flight. Well now Dutch carrier KLM is giving passengers the chance to choose with a service known as Meet and Seat, giving flyers access to their fellow travellers' Facebook or LinkedIn profiles. Here's a neat little cartoon sketch by Next Media Animation. So whether it's used for business networking or sky dating remains to be seen. Tweet of the week time now and the travel bloggers at Gadling posted this amazing video of flying rhinos in South Africa. Endangered black rhinos were recently moved from the Eastern Cape to a conservation area in Limpopo using a new aircraft capture technique. The WWF project has created seven significant black rhino populations over the last eight years. What a fantastic sight for safari goers in the area. And finally, here's a behind the scenes video of what happens to your bag when it leaves you at the airport. It's all part of a Delta baggage tracker mobile app promotion. But unfortunately, the most interesting part, the Transport Security Administration area was blacked out. Boo, see you next time. Thanks, Carmen. Now, by the end of the last century, travel and holidaying had become an institution in the calendar of the average family and a source of income for many people in emerging economies too. But is tourism stuck in a rut? How do we get out of the routine of going to a foreign country, taking pictures of ourselves in front of old buildings, emailing to our friends just to say, I was there? Ah, the dreaming spires of Oxford. Classic Renaissance architecture, rich in history and tradition, a tourist honey trap. Over and over and over and over and over. 
But according to this cultural theorist, many tourists today are missing the point. And in order to see the future of travel, you have to understand the past. The problem with travel today is that we're following itineraries that were set three or four hundred years ago by the aristocratic grand tourists of Europe whose aim was to go and have a high culture experience, going to somewhere like Italy and seeing the Sistine Chapel or the Colosseum. And we're doing the same thing. We're having a list of monuments to see, a list of landmarks to go and see, which aren't really appropriate for the modern age. Perhaps, you know, it might be from your position a, a, a good thing to, to adopt this attitude. But don't forget there are loads of people who work very hard and for whom going abroad for two weeks in the sun, not thinking too much, is a wonderful relief. Are you knocking that? I'm not knocking that at all, and of course, sometimes we just need to relax. You know, I've got two kids and there's nothing better than switching off sometimes. But for 200 years, we've been sold this idea of a getaway holiday, a kind of a release from everyday life. But that holiday was invented by factory bosses in the 19th century who wanted to give their workers a week off so they could then come back and slave away at the assembly line. And I don't think we should fall for that trick. So the future of travel apparently is not just about venturing further and further afield, ticking boxes and collecting famous monuments, or indeed transforming more coastlines into upmarket beach paradises. Morning. But you're from Naples. What are you doing cooking alla Romana? We, are, we do mix Italian food. No, it's about engaging with people and cultures. Stopping eating chocolate. These are like those Italian date tomatoes or something like that. Yeah. The fantastic thing about modern travel is that it's all right here on our doorsteps. And globalization's made it possible because all the different cultures from the world have come to most of the towns and cities in the world. I can walk down a street like this here in Oxford, Cowley Road, and I can meet Brazilians and Italians, Somalis, Nigerians. And what I've discovered really is that the real monuments in a city aren't the old buildings and the art galleries. The real monuments are the people. They're the ones with the stories to tell. And so I think the future of travel is about having conversations with strangers. Point taken, but surely part of going away is being immersed in a different culture and its finest architectural achievements, not just making new friends round the corner from where you live. And the magic of discovery is only now opening up to millions of people around the world. It's estimated 100 million new Chinese tourists will be unleashed on the market by 2020. Who are we to say that they're getting it wrong? Well, what happened in the 19th century was there was a huge explosion of tourism across Europe. And of course, there was an explosion of guidebooks as well. And those guidebooks simply followed and copied wholesale the routes and the tours taken by the aristocrats of the previous 200 years. And today's guidebooks are doing exactly the same thing. They haven't really changed. So if the guidebook is killing our instinctive curiosity, can technology lead us into new ways of seeing and experiencing what they call in the business augmented reality? The future of travel is likely to be shaped by technological innovations which reduce stress. Buzzwords abound in this vision of the future of travel. Augmented reality is all about a more interactive experience with buildings and places. Your smartphone tells you what you're looking at, for instance. A new report by technology provider Amadeus says airports will become paperless and fingerprints are boarding passes. All technophiles argue the future is in your digital breadcrumbs, being used to make recommendations more customised to your personal preference. In essence, through technology, we'll be always connected in the information ecosystem. We'll take on this always connected traveller concept to the, to the nth degree. So we will have things like near-field communications and chips planted in, in, in watches or devices or even under our skin and things like that, which will be feeding us information about things that we want to do that will automatically take us through security at airports. It's something like that actually I don't think is 20 years away, I think that's probably more, more like five years away. Um, so, but very, very powerful devices that we either wear or are on handheld computers that will just kind of make the travel process more efficient. I think travel is all about the art of conversation and nurturing curiosity about strangers. The problem with digital technology is that it often gives us a very superficial conversation with people. It's much more about exchanging information than about knowledge about life. You know, it's very much opting in and opting out whether you want to be bombarded with all information, certain types of information, or most importantly, information that's actually going to enhance your travel experience. And that's still, I think, going to be primarily a human function because we're the ones who know what we want. 
ultimately, perhaps, the message is travelling doesn't just have to be a ritual nor an escape or sanctuary from the rigours of the nine to five. It can actually improve our regular lives. Ironically, it was a 19th century lay preacher, the man whose name is now inextricably associated with the package holiday, who articulated this first. To travel is to dispel the mists of fable and clear the mind of prejudice taught from babyhood and facilitate perfectness of seeing eye to eye. Food for thought there. Do you think we've reached the end of the road when it comes to the way we travel? Or do you feel it's a no-brainer that, of course, if you go to Paris, you're going to want to see the Eiffel Tower and the Louvre? Email us and let us know. Sadly, that's all we've got time for this week on Fast Track, but join us again next week when we take a look at how much it will cost you to buy a ticket to the UK this year, with air passenger duty due to rise in a few months' time. Remember that you can always find more on our website, bbc.com forward slash fast track, and don't forget to take a look at bbc.com travel as well. Where this week they're featuring the world's coolest movie theatres and Svalbard, Norway's northernmost frontier. But for now, from me, Raj and Data, and the rest of the fast track team, thank you very much for watching. Wherever you're going next, enjoy your travels and goodbye. <laughs>